Dalton Kincaid, 2.1 points. Andrews, 3.4. London, 3.5. Harrison, 1.4. Caleb Williams, 7.2. Raheem Mostert, 3.9. McLaurin, 3.7. Alave, 3. Deontay, 3. Javante, 3. JSN, 3. There is so much to talk about with what just happened this week. We're going to go game by game. I'm going to go position by position. We're going to talk about it all. Starting off in Minnesota, Sam Darnold looked very good at the beginning of the game. Now, this is a game that gets out of hand between the Vikings and Giants, so Darnold doesn't really have to throw the ball in the second half. The passing volume looks fine. Obviously, you're not worried about how many points Sam Darnold's scoring. The only thing you care about here is Aaron Jones, Jordan Addison, and Justin Jefferson in this offense. Going over to Aaron Jones, Aaron Jones has a great day from a points perspective. 94 rushing yards, gets you the rushing touchdown. And Aaron Jones at the same time has two receptions, 15 receiving yards. It's beautiful. However, if you're looking at what you have with the PFF data here, you're actually seeing that the snaps played with Aaron Jones were 30. Ty Chandler plays 20 snaps. Ty Chandler does have three targets. Ty Chandler, I mean, does go out and have eight carries. So it is a spot where we should expect, oh, okay, it's probably going to be a committee. If this offense isn't great every single week, Aaron Jones probably not super reliable. I'd say Jones probably a low-end RB2 based off this game, but I mean, happy if you put him in your lineup. And then going over to Jefferson, Jefferson looks like Darnold's going to be just fine for him. He's not going to be the wide receiver one overall in fantasy, but should be a wide receiver one where you drafted him. Now, Addison getting injured sucks here. I drafted a lot of Addison in underdog basketball drafts. If you play in a league with only two wide receivers and one flex, probably doesn't make a difference for you. I will say you may hear some people scream, oh, you need to go pick up Jalen Naylor off the way. Don't bother picking up anybody off the waiver wire here in Minnesota. Justin Jefferson's going to dominate targets. Sam Darnold's not good enough to support a wide receiver two playing alongside Jefferson. So really not much has changed outside. We're going to have to monitor this Jordan Addison injury. Now going over to the Giants, y'all know I was adamantly against taking Malik Neighbors at the 2-3 turn in drafts this year because Daniel Jones is a bum. Daniel Jones is a... Look at what just happened. 42 pass attempts for Daniel Jones. Almost 50 dropbacks for Daniel Jones. And you have 186 passing yards. Two interceptions. Zero touchdowns. I guess you can say one touchdown to the other team. Like we said, going over to the running backs, if Saquon Barkley couldn't be productive in this situation, Singletary has no shots. Going over and looking at the wide receiver data here, I mean, Malik Neighbors does play every single snap, literally 70 snaps out of those 70. Wondell Robinson does lead this team with targets with a total of 12. I think Neighbors will continue to be startable as a mid-wide receiver too, but the thing is the ceiling is going to be severely capped, even if he's a phenomenal player, just based off Daniel Jones being his quarterback. Now, somebody that we thought was actually going to elevate the ceiling of the wide receivers in his offense. You had Kirk Cousins going over to Atlanta, and all of a sudden, he was going to save Drake London. He was going to save Kyle Pitts. He was going to save Bijan Robinson. Now, it looks like Bijan may be getting saved, but that's not due to Kirk Cousins. Instead, that's due to just the change with his overall usage with Arthur Smith completely out of here. You actually have 50 snaps for Bijan Robinson out of a total 56 Looks like Bijan is just going to go out there and absolutely dominate from a workload perspective. Bijan has himself an okay day. I mean, 68 rushing yards, but he does have five receptions and 43 receiving yards. This is a floor game from Bijan Robinson. It is only up from here. Now, going over to the receivers, Drake London plays every single snap, runs every single route, draws three targets for two receptions and 15 receiving yards after getting drafted in the second round in pretty much every single draft. Hell, in the Flock League, Sal took him at the very beginning of the second. Tough scene. This is all due to how bad Kirk Cousins was today. Is I mean, yes, maybe you can point to, oh, Ray Ray McLeod had 50. Don't know. That doesn't matter. Cousins... 155 passing yards, one touchdown, two interceptions. You go over to Twitter, every single person, their mom screaming, we want Penix, we want Penix. We're one week in. We're one week in and people want Michael Penix. Kyle Pitts gets there with the receiving touchdown. If you look at the underlying usage, it's coming out from PFF. Nate Janky who tracks all the snap data. I mean, phenomenal graphs and stuff we're using in this video. 
Actually, Cal Pitts had a massive step up in terms of the percentage of snaps that he's playing in Atlanta in comparison to what you saw last season. A lot of this has to do with Johnny Smith gone, Arthur Smith gone. Pitts looks like one of the very few tight ends we may be able to rely upon, especially if all of a sudden Kirk Cousins is able to turn the corner against, I mean, potentially a worse defense than a fully healthy Pittsburgh Steelers one. So that's the hope you have here in Atlanta. The hope is that this was just a tough matchup going up against Pittsburgh. Going into the future, Kirk Cousins will get back to being close to 300 passing yards per game. And if that does happen, the dream's still alive for Drake London. The dream's still alive for Kyle Pitts. But in any game that Cousins is this bad, I mean, if he's this bad for two more games, Penix is in. And it doesn't matter how bad Cousins is because we're re-rolling the dice with hopefully a better quarterback. Now, going over to Pittsburgh, uh, this is where I'm going to start giving all crap. In the live stream this morning, I ran a poll. I was going back and forth in the flock league, stressing to no ends, Justin Fields, Caleb Williams, Justin Fields, Caleb Williams, Justin Fields. Caleb. I was starting Justin Fields. I threw up that poll. 70% of y'all told me to go through and play Caleb Williams. And when y'all give me crap for a bad start sick call, I'm allowed to give it back to you, all right? See how this feels. This is every day of my life here. But anyway, Justin Fields, obviously not good in real life. Justin Fields, I mean, not good for the receivers in this offense. Has 156 passing yards. Crazy is Pickens has over half of this. Fields really just locks into that one player, does not look at anybody else. But yeah, nobody's going to be viable as a receiver here with Fields under center. You're hoping that Russ comes back soon. Fields himself may be okay in fantasy. He had 57 rushing yards this week. The main storyline in Pittsburgh is going over and looking at their running back usage. Now, there are good things to see and there are bad things to see if you're a Najee Harris drafter. Najee Harris played the vast majority of snaps. He played 38 snaps out of a potential 69. He had the vast majority of touches. He had 20 carries in comparison to Jalen Warren at two. And that's the good news. The bad news is you could potentially come out here and say, well, maybe Jalen Warren just wasn't used because he's coming off the hamstring injury. And if the Warren role expands going into the future, this could be very bad news for Najee Harris because Cordell Patterson followed Arthur Smith over and actually looks like he's playing. Cordell Patterson did come out and have four carries. I mean, he did end up playing nine snaps. So I, I'm not saying like this is going to be something we really have to be worried about all year. It is just going to be something to monitor. Now, going over to Arizona, this was a very exciting game. Not if you started Marvin Harrison Jr. But anyway, starting off quarterback, Kyler Murray going to be viable in fantasy. Horrible day throwing the football. Off at 31 pass attempts, 162 passing yards, abysmal. But he does give you 57 rushing yards. And this is why the rushing production is so important because even in a really bad game, you're still getting there in fantasy. So Kyler is okay for himself if you are starting him. The running back usage is just absolutely massive here. Heavily skewed towards James Conner which helped me out, and he's really the only guy that came through for me this week in the Flock League. Ramondre Stevenson had himself a day on my bench. We'll talk about him in a second. But now in the Flock League, the only reason I'm in it to potentially win this thing on Monday night is because of James Conner's performance. I'll throw the screenshot here what the score currently is in the matchup. I would love to know your opinion on if we are going to win this or not, and I'd love to know what you need to win. And I would love to know what you need Monday night to win your week one matchup. But yeah, really, we're fading Christian McCaffrey going up against Thomas. But funny enough, actually, we're hoping Christian McCaffrey gets at least one yard because over there on Underdog Fantasy, they're providing us with a free Christian McCaffrey special pick -em, more than less than half a total yard for the Monday night game, only to code flock users. So if you want to take advantage of that, you can find the link in the description of this video in the comment section. If you use code flock over there on Underdog Fantasy, you're going to be getting a 50% deposit bonus up to $1,000 plus that Christian McCaffrey pick -em, plus a free team review from yours truly over there on flockfantasy.com. All you have to do is make sure that you have that account set up on flockfantasy.com with the same email address that you made that deposit on Underdog Fantasy with, with a minimum of $10. But going back over to Arizona, looking at Marvin Harrison Jr., this is the story that everybody's going to be talking about. 
He runs almost every single route possible here. He plays almost every single snap possible. It's not that Harrison was a part-time player and that's why he didn't produce. No, he was out there. He just drew a total of three targets. In comparison, Greg Dorch has eight. We'll talk about Greg Dorch on the waiver wire video. Trey McBride has nine. Harrison gives you absolutely nothing. There's the viral clip of him at the end of the game, wide open and does not get the ball from Kyler. Now, I will say, looking at Harrison going forward, I ranked him as a wide receiver too this week because, like I said, I expect rookies typically are going to start a little slower. Am I going to rank Harrison lower than a wide receiver too this next? Probably not. I still think he's an elite prospect. I still think this is going to be a better offense than it was this week. And he is still an every down player. So I think if you took him in round one, you probably took him a little too high. If you ranked him as a wide receiver one this week, you probably were a little disappointed. I know people were hating on us for ranking him too low in the wide receiver rankings video this week. Apparently, I ranked him way too high. So I think you run it back, start him next week. Don't panic sell him. He's a rookie. Give him a game. And in the case of Trey McBride, obviously only eight points, not phenomenal. The usage was great, though. You actually look at this. He ran 34 routes, which is right up there with Marvin Harrison Jr. at 36. He drew nine targets, which actually led this team. The issue was just Kyler Murray didn't have the passing volume. So the passing volume is there going into the future. It does look like McBride can absolutely crush. I am moving Trey McBride to my tight end two spot in our rest of season rankings over there on flogfantasy.com, which actually I think he was probably already there after the Kelsey game. Now moving over to the Buffalo side of things. Um, Josh Allen, obviously QB1 this week, QB1 the rest of season rankings, QB1 coming into the year. The reason is 15 rushing touchdowns last season. The reason is, is the man goes out there and just continuously racks up rushing production, rushing production, rushing production. He has two rushing touchdowns this game, 39 rushing yards. He gives you two passing touchdowns, 232 passing yards. Doesn't matter who his wide receivers are. Josh Allen is QB1. Now, going over to this wide receiver core, what's going to be very interesting is looking at Keon Coleman as a rookie leading this team in receiving right now. I think Keon Coleman is going to be an extremely strong option for all the teams that we drafted him on all offseason. Can't freaking wait. Am I starting him this next week? Uh, probably not, right? I mean, the passing volume wasn't crazy here in Buffalo. Hopefully, if you get a potential shootout going into the future, you could see more targets going in the direction of Keon Coleman. There are just so many players that are drawing targets right now. I mean, in this week, you had Keon, Shakir, James Cook, Matt Collins, Dawson Knox, MVS, Curtis Samuel, Ray Davis, Dalton Kincaid, and Ty Johnson, all drawing target volume. So uh, Keon definitely is my guy rest of season out of this wide receiver core. Clear Shakir definitely looked really good. I mean, obviously scores a touchdown. I will point out Curtis Samuel doesn't really do anything. Curtis Samuel only plays 17 snaps out of 61. Now Curtis Samuel is dealing with the turf toe coming into the week. And y'all know I was a Curtis Samuel hater all off season. So I would love to come out here in victory lap. The situation's probably just Curtis Samuel was injured. I don't necessarily think we need to read too, too much into this. If the usage is still horrendous for Curtis Samuel in weeks two and three, then at that point, I think go ahead and cut him. But it's way, way too early to just say that this is going to be the rotation for Buffalo through the rest of the year. Now, somebody I did draft a lot. I drafted a lot of Dalton Kincaid, and um, it does not look good sitting with a total of one reception for 11 receiving yards this week. Does not look good sitting with a total of one freaking target. When Dawson Knox, on the other hand, uh, I guess only has one reception as well, but 23 receiving yards, Dawson Knox outproduces. If it matters at all, it doesn't. So I know this is going to spur a lot of people to panic. Very similar to what we are with some of these other tight ends. And by no means is this a good thing. Obviously, this is very, very bad and we should be concerned. I am still going to be ranking Kincaid as a tight end one rest of season. If you look at the underlying usage, Dalton Kincaid did play over 75% of the snaps. He ran a ton of routes. Kincaid played 51 out of 61 snaps. He ran 25 routes out of 30 potential dropbacks. So the underlying usage metrics look okay for Kincaid. The question is, is he good enough to expand on this? Now, going over to Chicago, this is where I went wrong. This is why I possibly lose in the Flock League. I freaking started Caleb Williams. I started DeAndre Swift. 
and I feel horrible about it. Caleb Williams gives us 93 passing yards off of 29 pass attempts. Now, yes, Keenan Allen does get banged. A couple wide receivers in this offense get banged up this week. So Keenan getting banged up, definitely going to skew the route run data here just a bit. But it just doesn't matter. For Caleb to look this bad, I think the only Bears player that is startable until we see otherwise is DJ Moore. Not only does DJ Moore have a ton of targets with eights, but he also just looks like the best guy out here. I mean, Keenan Allen was flooded with targets with 11, but it's not Keenan's doing anything with them. So I, I'm starting DJ Moore going into the future, but I'm not starting Keenan. I'm not starting Caleb. I'm not starting Roma Dunze until we see a better game from Caleb Williams. There's just an outside chance that he does start off slowly. And then Nathan Jakey also tweeted this out. Cole Komet ran 12 routes today out of a possible 33 pass plays. He was going through and he was tracking all the data with tight ends between Cole Komet and Gerald Everett during the preseason. All the preseason usage said, oh yeah, Cole Komet is not going to be viable in fantasy. Now I'm an idiot. So I was going, oh, maybe it's just preseason. Maybe we get to the year and they realize Komet's the better option. No, 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 no. Um, yeah, Komet is now droppable in fantasy football. RIP, pour one out. And it's a sad day. I thought Komet was pretty good. I thought he was going to be okay this year, but apparently not. Now, going over to the Tennessee side of things, um, yeah, Vegas projected this out to be a bottom five offense in the league. We were talking about avoiding the receivers for that reason, and we got a lot of hate for it, saying they were going to be great. Will Levis, 127 passing yards off 32 pass attempts. Two interceptions, one touchdown. DeAndre Hopkins doesn't really play here. DeAndre Hopkins, I mean, plays a total of 17 snaps. Keep in mind, he's a little boo-boo in the knees. He's going to be playing through it literally all season. And this is why we were talking about selling DeAndre Hopkins going to the week, just because I don't see how he's viable as the wide receiver two in one of the worst offenses in the NFL. In his, what, 12th season in the NFL? Dealing with this injury through the entire year? Hopkins not startable until you see otherwise. You're not going to be able to sell him now. Nobody's buying. And you can't drop him. Going over to Ridley, Ridley does dominate in terms of the target share numbers. The issue is just the offense is too bad. So if you're going to see Ridley be productive going forward, you just need a better game from Will Levis. The main takeaway you're going to have in Tennessee is the running back usage. Looks like all the, the reports saying, oh yeah, we're playing the hot hands. It's just going to be um, Tony Pollard, then Taji Spears, Tony Pollard, then Taji Spears. There's no starter here. Seems like it was kind of nonsense. It seems like there's a very clear definition of roles. Early downs, Tony Pollard's out there. Looking at this graph from PFF, 32 snaps in the early downs, you had Pollard. Eight, you had Taji Spears. If it's third down or the two-minute drill, it's going to be Taji Spears in the game. Two-minute drill, Spears had all five snaps. Third down, Spears had 12. Pollard had one. So looks like it's a very clear backfield in terms of the roles and the definitions that you have. Now, am I super excited to run out there and go start Tony Pollard this next week? Probably not, right? Just because it is a pretty bad offense in general. Now, somebody I am going to start this next week. I don't care what the matchup is. I'm not leaving Ramondre Stevenson on my bench again. Now, yes, the New England Patriots offense doesn't really have any passing volume. 121 passing yards from Brissett, but the rushing is there. 120 rushing yards from Ramondre Stevenson off of 25 carries and the rushing touchdown. Ramondre at the same time does draw three targets out of the backfield. Now looking at what you have in terms of the snaps played, Ramondre Stevenson plays 51 snaps in comparison to Antonio Gibson at 13. Now Gibson was banged up going into this week. And at the same time, it's going to be one of the very, very, very few games the New England Patriots are able to win this season. So am I expecting Ramadre Stevenson to put out a game like this every single week? By no means am I. Honestly, we're going to keep this between you and me. I have him in the flock league. I'm definitely not going to tell them this. But I think Ramadre Stevenson is potentially a sell high. Definitely someone we were wanting to be starting right now. I just don't know how many games the New England Patriots actually win. And Gibson potentially expands his role if he is a little healthier. Now, going over to the Cincinnati side of things, we'll talk about Burrow in a second. Let's look at the running backs here because you can actually have a, an actionable take with the RBs. Zach Moss is the starter. Zach Moss plays 33 snaps in comparison to Chase Brown at 17. Zach Moss comes away with the rushing touchdown. Zach Moss has four targets out of the backfield as well. 
Zach Moss looks like he is startable in fantasy football going into the future. You still roster Chase Brown. Maybe these roles switch. Maybe the Chase Brown role expands as the season progresses. Brown's not startable unless we see these snaps flip, unless you see an injury to Zach Moss. But he is definitely someone you're wanting to roster because this offense should be better going to the future than it was this week. Horrible week. Horrible week for Cincinnati. Chase... It gives us six receptions, 62 receiving yards. Honestly, with what was happening in the first quarter, if you would have told me this final stat line at the end of the game, I would have just accepted it for Jamar Chase. But Joe Burrow just doesn't do anything. Joe Burrow, 164 passing yards off of 29 pass attempts. I know a lot of people are panicking here. All these player interviews after the game are going viral. I think people are trying to make it out to be a bigger deal than it is that they lose to the New England Patriots. It is a big deal, but keep in mind, Chase hasn't been to practice at all. T. Higgins did miss this game. And the Cincinnati Bengals under Zach Taylor have always started slow. This is their MO. This is what they do. So if this opens up a buy low low moment on Chase, if this opens up a buy low moment on T. Higgins, I probably would take advantage. Now going over to the Houston game, this is a very, very interesting game to look at. First off, let's keep it stupid simple. Joe Mixon dominates. Joe Mixon looks to be a top 10 running back rest of season. Joe Mixon is just absolutely crushing. Now, we can move on behind that. I mean, Joe Mixon, 30 carries, 159. I don't know. Why would we need to talk about this? The receivers is what's interesting. So just to let you know, obviously, I made that strong stance sitting here on specifically Stefan Diggs over Tank Dell. Got a lot of hate for it this offseason. And I would love to come run around going, oh my gosh, look at me. Look at Stefan Diggs. Now, it helped my teams, my best ball teams on underdog that Diggs did well. But I actually saw this tweet from, let's see who it was, from Jay Gibbs on Twitter. Jacob Gibbs. Week one targets, Nico Collins, seven. Tank Dell, seven. Stefan Diggs, six. Week one air yards. Nico Collins, 112. Tank Dell, 105. Stefan Diggs, nine. Yes. Um, while Diggs has the touchdowns, it is crazy to see how the air yards are distributed in this offense. And I think this does go to show that maybe if you wanted to go out there and buy low on Tank Dell, it's not a bad idea. Now, if you're looking at the usage, the reason I ranked Stefan Diggs over Tank Dell this year is because Diggs was playing in two wide receiver sets. Dell looked like he was only playing in three wide receiver sets. But if you look at the underlying routes run, Diggs runs 35 routes. Dell runs 34. Nico Collins runs 33. They're all about the same. So while Diggs is the guy who scores the touchdowns this week, while Tank Dell only has seven points, I hope this is the case rest of season. I really do. The reality is these guys are going to probably be really close, right? I think we're going to get some Tank Dell weeks going forward. I think Stefan Diggs is going to have some dud weeks going forward. And that's just going to be the nature of the game here in Houston. Um, Nico Collins is definitely the guy I still thinks the wide receiver one. Definitely still ranking him there rest of season. And then with CJ Stroud, not much to talk about. I mean, he does have uh, 234 passing yards, multiple passing touchdowns. I think you could actually get more passing volume going around in the future here in Houston. Now, let's go over and let's look at Anthony Richardson. Now, right at the beginning of the game, you had the absolute bomb to Alec Pierce. Probably the most exciting play of the game, or at least at the time that I'm recording this, or at least out of the plays that I saw. And not only did you have that bomb, but with Anthony Richardson, you also had 56 rushing yards and the rushing touchdown. I had Anthony Richardson ranked as QB3 in my rankings this week specifically because this rushing upside. So Richardson comes out, he maintains, he is a must-start quarterback every single week. But I will say at the same time, he had nine completions in this offense. So looking at the wide receivers here, I think you probably even move Michael Pittman Jr. down further, especially if Josh Downs is coming back soon. I know some people are going to see that 60-yard receiving touchdown from Alec Pierce. They're going to see at 125 receiving yards this week, and they're going to run out and grab Pierce. I expect the Pierce role to possibly slowly decline and the Adonai Mitchell role to slowly improve, even if I'm not a big Adonai Mitchell fan myself. So I would probably let one of your other league mates go after Pierce. But looking at the running back usage here, good things and bad things. One, 
Jonathan Taylor actually has 100% of the carries in this backfield. He almost has 100% of the snaps. He has 43 out of 45 snaps. Trey Sermon has two. So Jonathan Taylor is going to get absolutely everything. But the issue that we talked about in the offseason is Anthony Richardson is going to potentially vulture rushing touchdowns. And at the same time, Anthony Richardson is not going to check the ball down very often. So that will make things a little bit difficult here for JT. Now, going over to Miami, there's not much to discuss with the receivers and Tua, right? Tua potentially is going to lead the NFL in passing yet again. Tyreek potentially is going to lead the NFL in receiving yet again. Jalen Waddell is going to be a play that you want every single week in your lineup. We already know this. Now, going to the running backs, this is where things get interesting. So there were two different takes we had on Devon Achan this year. One, he was not going to be able to get to 20 plus touches a game. If Achan was going to see that running back one, running back two, running back three overall finish, what you are going to need to see from Achan is for him to turn into prime Alvin Kamara, have everything as a receiver and everything at the goal line. That's what you needed to see. Achan in this game gets the goal line usage over Raheem Mostert. Massive checkbox there. HN in this game, seven receptions, 76 receiving yards. Another massive checkbox. The two things you needed to see just happened week one. HN going into the future, we had him ranked behind CMC, Bijan, Brees, Taylor, Barkley, Gibbs. We had HN as our RB7. There's a chance that Achan may be moving up ahead of... I, it's way too early to move him ahead of JT, but in a full PBR format, if this receiving usage keeps up, like you have to think about it. Taylor had zero reception in his, in his own right. Now, going over and looking at the tight end usage here, um, Johnny Smith had 20 snaps out of 71. Johnny Smith, you cut him if you have him. Now, on the Jacksonville side of things... Y'all know that Tank Bigsby, at one point this offseason, was my most drafted running back on underdog going in round 18. The reason for this is if you listen to the coaching staff, sounded like Bigsby was going to have a role this season, and then he was a clear handcuff back if ETN were to go down. Bigsby leads this team in rushing. Bigsby, 73 rushing yards, ETN 44. ETN does have the rushing touchdown. ETN also draws the targets out of the backfield. You shouldn't expect Tank Bigsby to be a receiver unless you were to get an ETN injury. Now, I'm not going to come out here and scream, oh, start Tank Bigsby next week. Obviously not. But now Tank Bigsby has proven that if ETN were to go down, he is 100% viable. Tank Bigsby is somebody that needs to be rostered in every single format, and I am pissed at myself. So mad. And the Flock League, who did I take in the last round? Tank Bigsby. Who did I cut for Samaj P. Ryan when he signed with the Chiefs? Tank Bigsby. And then I freaking cut Samaj P. Ryan to pick up Justin Fields. So now here's what I'm going to have to do. I'm going to have to mosey over to the waiver wire this week, throw some fab dollars to pick up the player that I literally had seven days ago. And that's I, and I don't even know if I'll get him. Now going over to the receiving usage, Brian Thomas Jr. has the receiving touchdown. Super exciting stuff. But ultimately, the passing volume's not there. Lawrence has 162 passing yards. I get just another dud offense. Evan Ingram gives you absolutely nothing. And Evan Ingram only runs 19 routes today. That is concerning. Gabe Davis plays by far and away the most. Christian Kirk actually played the, the least out of these receivers. I don't know if I'm super excited to start any Jacksonville Jaguar wide receiver right now, though. Now, going over to Washington. Another dud game passing. You have 184 passing yards for Jaden Daniels. Now, with that being said, Jaden Daniels, Gives you the elite ceiling in fantasy based off of one thing and one thing alone, rushing production. Jaden Daniels, 88 rushing yards, two rushing touchdowns. Let's just get out the little calculator here. 8.8 .8 plus 12 times 25. The Jaden Daniels rushing production is equivalent to 520 passing yards in fantasy football. So it doesn't matter if he's that bad of a passer. He is going to lap these guys like Tua. He's going to lap these guys like Jared Goff. He's going to lap these guys like Matthew Stafford that won't run the ball at all. Now, going over to a receiver that I took in the flock league, somebody that I've historically been 
anti against. I was against early in the season. I bought in at the end of the year once Dotson was traded, once I signed. Terry McLaurin does freaking nothing. Terry McLaurin, four targets. It looks like Daniels is not able to look downfield. Looking at the receiving volume, four targets for Austin Eckler, four targets for Brian Robinson, three targets for Zach Ertz, three targets for Luke McCaffrey. Everything's close to the line of scrimmage. Maybe this was the defensive scheme from Tampa. Maybe in another week, it is a little bit better. But Terry McLaurin's not startable until we see otherwise. Like, I have McLaurin in the flock league. There's no way in hell he comes close to my starting lineup. Now, going over to Tampa, you get a four-touchdown game from Baker Mayfield. You have touchdown going to Godwin. Two touchdowns going to Evans. Touchdown going to Jalen McMillan. Um, Godwin's a must-start guy every week. Evans, must-start guy every week. A lot of people are going to be talking about the Bucky Irving, Rashad White rushing splits. So Bucky Irving looks great, has 62 rushing yards off of only nine carries. Now, I don't want to overreact, and I don't want to say, oh, you need to panic sell Rashad White. Because the entire reason you drafted Rashad White in a full PBR format is his receiving volume. He had six receptions for 75 receiving yards. He was an inefficient running back last year, and he was still okay in fantasy. So he can be an inefficient running back again this season and still be okay in fantasy. Now going over to the Los Angeles Chargers, another dud game passing, 144 passing yards for Herbert. Lad McConkey surprisingly gets there. He also has seven targets. I thought things were shaping up nicely for Joshua Palmer. Oh, it doesn't matter if DJ Chark's out. It doesn't matter if it's Lad McConkey's first game ever. Looks like Palmer ain't him. All right. I mean, if you're looking at this, Palmer plays the most snaps. He plays 46 snaps. He runs the most routes. He runs 27 routes. But no, he does nothing. Palmer's not startable until we see otherwise. Um, Lad McConkey looks like he's for sure trending in the right direction. The issue is it's difficult to go out there and just jam him in when the passing volume is so low in this offense. The main storyline here, though, is J.K. Dobbins, I believe this is his second best game ever in his NFL career. And this is... Year number five, 135 rushing yards, the rushing touchdown. You also get, I mean, some target volume out of the backfield, three receptions. Doesn't really do anything with them, but it's nice seeing that he is getting targeted. Just more opportunities equals more fantasy points. So I, the thing is, if you look at the split, it's just so tough. J.K. Dobbins slightly edges out Gus Edwards. It looks like Dobbins is going to get everything on third down. It looks like they're going to split the early downs. So Dobbins is for sure very exciting, and I think he becomes a borderline flex play. I would like to see it one more week for J.K. Dobbins, though. Now, going up against the Raiders, I was praying that Devontae Adams had himself a bad day. Found myself in this position again. I found myself in that position before, going back two years ago and won the 150K on underdog. But regardless, Adams does have five receptions, 59 receiving yards, only scores 10.9 points against us. So we're staying alive in the flock league. I don't know why I'm talking about this, though. The important thing is the running back usage. Looking at Alexander Madison, Zamir White, they split the backfield. Zamir White was not exciting for me in fantasy because it's a bad offense where he's not going to catch the ball. And now you 100% have confirmation that he is not catching the ball at all. Alexander Madison gets all nine snaps on third down. Alexander Madison sees 10 out of the 11 snaps in the two-minute drill as well. So now you have 100% confirmation that Zamir White will not have anything as a receiver in this offense. Alexander Madison ends up playing 36 snaps to Zamir White at 23. Zamir White, not startable in fantasy. Alexander Madison, you have to pick him up off the waiver wire if he's out there right now. Um, the other interesting note is Brock Bowers actually leads this team in target volume in his first NFL game ever. So Bowers looks like he's one of the very few tight ends that's actually going to be relevant here. I mean, and I, I think he has to be a must-start guy every single week now. I mean, I, I ranked him behind Dallas Goddard this week, which I feel like a clown for at this point. Now, going over to New Orleans, oh my gosh, New Orleans drops a zillion points here. You have multiple rushing touchdowns. You have three Derek Carr passing touchdowns. So we're going to assume that Chris Olave just went nuclear. The only solid weapon in New Orleans, in Chris Olave, in a game where they score five offensive touchdowns, must have 
crushed souls of his opponents. Oh, wait. Um, Chris Olave, is that him down there with two targets for two receptions and 11 receiving yards? Is that Foster Moreau up there with four receptions, 40? Uh, Olave does nothing in a game where the Saints score all the points. Olave is a massive follower down my rankings. Now, of course, this wasn't a real football game. The Carolina Panthers are not even JV. The Carolina Panthers are a freshman football team going up against varsity. So I don't know how much we can take away from the usage here. Kamara looks solid. Kamara does have five targets, five receptions, and the rushing touchdown. Derek Carr looks okay, but I mean, in reality, like I said, this is not a football game. I will say for damn sure, um, Alave is falling down my rankings uh, 100%. Going over to the Carolina side of things, Obviously, I'll know we've been off the receivers all offseason. Calling Deontay Johnson one of the most overrated guys in fantasy. I stand by. Yeah, that's the case. Don't scream at me that this coaching staff's all of a sudden going to save Bryce Young in Carolina. The only guy that was appropriately priced in this offense was Xavier Leggett in underdog drafts, which I still have hope for. Have a ton of Leggett. Keep pounding. But anyway, Bryce Young, 30 pass attempts, 161 passing yards, two interceptions, 13 completions for Bryce Young. You go over to the running backs here. I thought Chuba Hubbard was startable this week. His underdog pick was like higher, lower 80 yards. Chuba Hubbard splits with Miles Sanders. If you're splitting with Miles Sanders in the worst offense in the NFL, you are not startable. Um, the wide receiver room is just a rotation of guys. You have targets going to Thielen, Mingo, Leggett, Deontay. None of these guys are startable in fantasy. The only player I would roster in a regular redraft league would possibly be Deontay Johnson. But there's just no upside here, which has been the issue. The other guy we were saying to sell because there's no upside in his offense either, Denver. Doesn't matter if they look good in the preseason. Vegas was telling us it's a bad offense. It's very easy to see it was going to be a bad offense. Bo Nix, 42 pass attempts, 138 passing yards, and two interceptions. Absolutely garbage. No receiver here is viable. The running backs aren't viable either. It got some hate with how low we ranked Javante Williams this past week. I would have ranked him even lower if I knew what the split was going to be. This was indeed a three-man backfield. You had Audric Estime mixing in just a tiny bit. You had Jaleel McGoughlin. You had Javante Williams. Now, obviously, game flow kind of got away from the Broncos here. But it doesn't matter. The game script's going to get away from them in a ton of games. It's a very bad football team. Cortland Sutton dominates in terms of the target share with 12 targets, but it doesn't matter when it's a bad offense. We've already showed the historical data. The wide receivers aren't going to produce. Cortland Sutton gives you 38 receiving yards. The only guys that are rosterable here are Jaleel, Javante, and Sutton, and they're not startable anytime soon. Now, going over to the Seattle Seahawks, Kenneth Walker has himself a day. And you may remember, I, uh, I don't want to admit this out loud, took Terry McLaurin over Kenneth Walker in the Flock League, and I could not be regretting it more than I am now. Not only does he have the 100 yards rushing and the rushing touchdown, but he also suffered an abdomen injury, which actually skews the snap data. You had 23 snaps for Charbonnet. If Walker stayed healthy through the entire game, he would have been an even larger bell cow than this. Now, initial reports, he's saying that he is good. Obviously, we're hoping that we get more information tomorrow. The other storylines that we'll have here is at wide receiver, where you are looking at Jackson Smith and Jigba, according to this chart made from PFF, continuing to rise with his snap rate. So y'all know I've been a massive JSN hater this year. But with that being said... This is good news for him. He does play more snaps pretty much than he has at any point in his NFL career. Lockett does lead the team in targets, even though Lockett was banged up heading into the week. I think the only guy that's startable in Seattle will be Kenneth Walker while healthy and potentially DK Metcalf. But remember, Metcalf, at least historically, and I stand by that I think he's this again this year, it's just the high-end wide receiver three, low-end wide receiver two. Now, going over to Cleveland, this was the game that I was watching in the afternoon because I had Amari Cooper going. 
And Amari Cooper, um, don't need to focus in on this too, too much. Wide open, ball right through his hands, cost me 11 points, possibly cost me my week one matchup. But anyway, Deshaun Watson looked like garbage. Deshaun Watson looked like a quarterback that should not be starting in the NFL. It was painful to watch. 45 pass attempts, 169 passing yards, two interceptions. Jerome Ford gets there based off just the touchdown at the very end of the game that was meaningless. But he did have six receptions for 25 receiving yards, full PPR format. Obviously, just getting these cheap little targets out of the backfield when you're the only guy there will make you viable. So Ford gets there and he'll continue to be startable just because there's no Chubb and he's going to get absolutely everything. But it's not something that you should be excited for. And going over to wide receiver, Amari dominates the target volume. Judy gets the touchdown. But no Cleveland wide receiver is startable until we see Deshaun Watson look better. And I would love to get some of your help in the comment section. But for week two, I'm already realizing that I am either going to have to start Amari or Terry in my second flex spot. And that is terrifying. Now on the Dallas side of things, it's not really a football game. So it's very difficult to look at the split between Ezekiel and Rico Dowdle and say, okay, we know this is exactly going to be the case going into the future. Zeke comes away with a rushing touchdown, but I think we'll probably get a better sense of this in week two when it's more of a football game and it's actually competitive. Um, you have some injuries here. Uh, let's go back. Also, you had an injury with David Njoku, but here you have an injury with Jake Ferguson. We'll have to get continued news with this tomorrow. If Brandon Cooks banged up, Brandon Cooks gets you the touchdown here as well. CeeDee Lamb has 10 targets. CeeDee Lamb doesn't have a phenomenal day, but I mean, it was a tough matchup going up against this Cleveland defense, even if Dallas did have a ton of points. I want to kind of give Lamb the benefit of the doubt, but this is just very hard to take too much away with the usage because like we said, it's not really a football game. Deshaun Watson couldn't do anything at all. But I'm recording this about halftime of the Lions-Rams game. So I am really hoping we get a big performance for Sam Laporta. I'm going to drop the most up-to-date screenshot of my matchup at the end of this video. I would love if you told me in the comment section if you thought I was going to win this matchup. And also, I would love to know what you need Monday night for you to win. But, but thank you again. And of course... I highly recommend you taking advantage of the Christian McCaffrey special pick -em on Underdog Fantasy for Monday night. More than less than half a total yard. If you use code FLOCK, you're also going to get a 50% deposit bonus up to $1,000. Plus, if you use code FLOCK, you're going to get yours truly breaking down your fantasy football team for you on FLOCKFANTASY.COM in a live stream. So make sure you take advantage of that. But thank you again. I really do appreciate you. I really hope you have a great day. And I hope I get to see you out with the video tomorrow.